Hey everybody and welcome back to another episode of The Breakdown, this new style of video that we call The Breakdown because we are breaking down the message from the past weekend. If this is your first time watching it, you can find us here on YouTube or you can find us on any podcast form that you listen to. Just look up The Founder Church and you can find us there. Um, anywho, I'm here with Eric, anywho. breaking uh, down your message. Breaking it down, yeah. yeah. Did you do anything uh, for uh, Black Friday this past weekend? We did go shopping. We had a good time. Yeah. Went to a couple different malls. What uh, time? What's that? Like in the morning? Uh, later, like more like 12 to... Okay, it's not Actually like around time. one, so it wasn't crazy. Okay. The malls looked ransacked. <laughs> like there had been... You can't say riots because there's been a lot of riots in 2020. But it looks like they had been pillaged yeah. and we got the pickings. Ooh. So yeah, there wasn't very much good uh. left. So it was, it was good. I mean, we had a good time. We enjoyed it. But there wasn't a whole lot left in... In the stores. Uh, hard to believe. Yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> That's why That's I stick crazy. to online. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so I noticed we've both been wearing a black vest yeah. here too. Yeah, we look good. That wasn't coordinated. Like no. no. But it's uh, like there's Black Friday, there's Puffy Fest or Puffy Coat Monday, Puffy Vest. Puffy Vest Monday? Puffy Vest Monday. I think yeah. we should call it that. So. I have a puffy coat. Does that work? Dude, puffy coats don't work. Can we, we can rip the, the sleeves off yeah, of it. Yeah, can we <laughs> cut the sleeves off your coat? Yeah. <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> Thanks for wearing your puffy coat, Justin. <laughs> Looks good. It is kind of cold yeah. in here, actually. Hey, um, is that the titanium? Does that have the reflective internal interior like silver? Is it good? Is it? It's like tinfoil on the inside of your coat. Oh, you have to have base layers? What if you come naturally with extra layers? I would say after the holiday weekend, I have new layers. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> All right. Uh, Sorry. Yeah, well, anyway, um, we kind of uh, talked about doing things a little bit differently for the breakdown today. So yeah. normally we kind of have like a little bit of a list of questions to yeah. do. But I instead just took some notes on your message. And okay. I thought that we would just kind of um, see where this goes. I think we'll definitely still get some good content out of this. Yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, so towards the beginning of your message, you talked about like viewing a story through like a through like a mm -hmm. different lens because like there's different like eyewitness accounts or whatever. For so sure. we have four different gospels, mm -hmm. and I've never. So I've known that like yeah, there's there's Matthew, there's Mark, there's Luke, there's John, but if anybody asked me like what's the difference between them, I'd be like. Well, Mark's pretty short. <laughs> right, right, yeah. <laughs> I'd be like, That's I don't hilarious. really know. And That's awesome. So I think it'd be awesome if maybe we just kind of started out talking about like how, like what exactly like distinguishes each gospel. Yeah. So like we talked about on church, Matthew, uh, at church, Matthew is the more Jewish gospel. It just has... Um, a lot more of the Jewish history in it, and it it feels it feels like it's from a Jewish perspective, and it starts at the bloodline of Christ. And I think really for our teaching for our series, what we did, um, in in that being laid out that way, Matthew starts at the bloodline of Christ, which starts with Adam, mm -hmm. right? Uh, John, which is uh, which is written also by a Jewish person, but has a different feel to it. But John has all of time encapsulated. And John takes us back to the very beginning of creation, right? The word of God, Jesus, uh, speaking the very first thing out, which was the first word of creation was Christ. It was let there be light, Jesus, the light of the world. So Matthew starts at the bloodline. John starts at the very beginning of time. Like I said with Mark, Mark is like catching. Uh, Mark starts out in fifth gear at 130 miles an hour. You are just like, boom, you're on your way. It is going quick. And that's, that's awesome. But it was written more to the persecuted church in Rome uh, that was struggling uh, through horrible persecution and working to be faithful to Christ in the suffering. And Mark really highlights the fact that your suffering isn't indicative to Christ's victory being compromised. Your suffering is still something that accomplishes work for the kingdom. Jesus suffered and the victory he won, we are suffering with him. So it's very cool how Mark did that. And then, uh, of course, Luke, who is, uh, who is a physician, a Greek, he wrote the outsider's gospel. He didn't know Jesus uh, the way the other disciples did. 
He gathered firsthand witness accounts, gathered, compiled them together like more of a historical thesis, um, not thesis, but paper, and really made his, staked his claims off the firsthand witness accounts. And what's interesting in Luke and what Luke gives us is this idea that he went and got the accounts from the other people and their accounts matched up. Everything matched up, and he's like, wait a minute, all these people who I talked to and investigated this with all make the same claims of this Jesus Christ. So for him, it's this, it's for us, from him, it's this very powerful moment where we get to see what Mark found or what Luke found when he investigated it. That is so critical because that means it was, um, it was objective, he went in looking for the truth, and the truth he found was Jesus Christ. So Luke has this kind of elegant Greek in it, and it's beautifully written, and it's wonderful in its research, in its depth, in its accuracy, and a little bit more whole picture because he would have talked to Luke, or he would have talked to John. He would probably would have talked to Mark. He would have talked to Peter. He would have talked to Matthew. He would have talked to multiple sources to draw together this document. Yeah, so I love that about it. And Luke, being an outsider, writes in a language that me, as a Gentile, I've done Ancestry.com. I don't have any Jewish blood, which is kind of, you know, as a pastor, you want to just be a little bit, a little bit Jewish or something and say, you know, kind of rabbi, but I don't get to. <laughs> oh, I'm basically Irish and English. Uh, yeah, I was like, uh, I don't yeah. think I have any. Uh, <laughs> I know, got I have all the hair. dark hair. I thought, <laughs> oh, maybe there's some awesome, like, you know, some awesome genetic pool for me. Nope, yeah. I'm a genetic yawn. <laughs> I'm literally Ireland, Scotland, England, and Brittany, France. I'm like, eh, Belgium. Yeah, Ireland and Scotland, though, yeah. that's cool. I don't think I have either of them. And everybody thinks that, like, you know, the Irish are all redheads, but, you know, you look like Colin Farrell and different people. Mm. Uh, they're all dark, dark hair, dark black yeah. hair. Uh, a lot of the Scottish are the gingers. Um, so in that vein, hey, Phil Harvison. Just a little ginger yes, shout out there. The red yeah. panda. Yeah, the red panda. <laughs> oh man. So yeah, yeah, there's I don't know why. How do we get on genetics? Or uh, ancestry? Oh, it's because I'm yeah, not Jewish. Right. Yeah, I was just being lame. Yeah. I'm an outsider. Man. Amazing, I can forget something like <laughs> Yeah, I know. It's like, why were we even talking about that? Uh, I've lost arguments with myself. Really? Yeah. Oh. Uh, it's not easy. Allowed? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely in the car a lot. <laughs> Talk myself out of some stuff. Oh man, you said you're you're from Colorado, so okay. yeah. It's like I've always been from Michigan, so I guess like yeah, there's like a distinguish in like bloodline there too. So yeah, I mean you're you're from well the I think mostly the Dutch thing, then. Well, from me. Holland, I mean Holland, Michigan. <laughs> you're gonna have a real. I mean, the, I always laugh. I'm wearing wooden like, shoes below right. the shot here. <laughs> After this, he's gonna <laughs> garden. Um, no, but like being in Holland, Michigan. You know, when I came up here for the first time, I was blown away. I went to Erica's home church, which is first reformed in Zealand. What up first? And, um, and I'll never forget, they did uh, Pastor Scott Van Ostendorp, awesome guy. He did a children's sermon and he called for the children. He's like, all the kids come forward. It was the weirdest thing I'd ever seen because all these little blonde haired kids stood up and I'm like, what in the world? I, you know, I lived in Cal, so I grew up in Colorado, but I, I literally, I had kind of two different locations growing up. I grew up in Grand Junction, Colorado, and then in California. My dad's from the Central Valley of California, and then we lived in San Diego where I went to middle and high school um, in my early college years there. So I had been around a very ethnically diverse people group for a long time, 10 years in San Diego, but then a number of years in international missions. So coming to Zealand, and Holland, I did not realize, you know, it's the Dutch Empire, right? There's a lot of Dutch people up here, and everybody's a Van Volkenberg or a Van that, or, you know, <laughs> uh, my wife was a De Young. So, you know, these great Dutch names. It's really cool to get into that culture and see, like, you don't see many adult men who are blonde outside of, there's some, but just not the frequency you do here in West Michigan. Huh. It's, it's pretty unique up here. Um, how about, yeah, just the, the, the Dutch influence. I mean, we're in Zealand, you know, and Zealand yeah. and Drent and all the counties of the Netherlands are our towns around here. So oh. I don't know why we got in geography huh. about this, but yeah, our yeah. area is unique and, um, and it has its own cultural resonance. And what's cool is those traditions are going on, even though we have a very strong like Latin population, 
And so just seeing the diversity within um, like tulip time and stuff every May, I love that. I love how, um, how these, these traditions go beyond ethnic boundaries. They're part of our community. And I love that aspect of diversity and I love that a- aspect of heritage. We have a Dutch heritage. It's awesome to celebrate. It's not perfect, but it's really good. And there's some great aspects to it. And now there's other people bringing their um, their, I think, their background and their, their family traditions into it. And it just, I don't know, it makes it better. I, yeah. I love that kind of stuff. Huh. So, yeah. Well, anyway, back to those four Gospels. Yeah, right? um, do you have a favorite of the four? I like Mark a lot. Yeah. Um, ironically, I read him the least. I read that Gospel the least. Um, John and Luke um, kind of... That's where I spend a lot of my time in the Gospels. Luke has uh, a ton of the parables. There's so many more parables in Luke. Uh, the stories that Jesus taught with, and I really enjoy that. Um, so I spend a lot of time there. I would say probably Luke. Um, no, no, no. I Oh, this is my dilemma. Uh, uh, like when we got our Gospel table here, I got oh, the Gospel yeah. of John, because that's always been kind of my favorite. I, sure. I love the Gospel of John. And I think it's because... Um, this this overarching Christ eternal, um, you know, from the very beginning there was Christ, and at the very end there's Christ. It's very much a theme in the Gospel of John, and I love that about it. So, um, so I'm going to say this: there's a three way tie for first with um, with uh, Mark, Luke, and John, just being the ones that I feel like I connect with most. Mm-hmm. But one of my favorite series I ever taught on the bloodline of Christ came right out of Matthew. Nice. So what I do is in, in compiling them all. I, I just love them. I love them. I don't have one. I, that was a long way to say, no, huh. I can't pick one. Uh, huh. I can't pick one. That's fine. That was very At least you got to think about it now. Yeah, so yeah. If anybody yeah. else asks you. But if I had to have a table made of a gospel, it would be John, because we did. And I got to choose it. Sure. I was in, by the way, if you guys wonder about our gospel table, check it out. And you can, uh, you can find him, Max Macarios. He does them. He's an awesome woodworker. Um, in the area, he's got a store at Woodland Mall. He nice. loves the Word of God, and he's trying to get people to read it by doing tables and different things like that. That's awesome. Really cool. Yeah, that's such a cool table. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah well, maybe he'd like include a picture of it. Yeah, I think this. I've got That'd a picture awesome. of it I can Sweet. throw up. Yeah, definitely. So um, I also wrote down, because you, you talked about, um, so we're talking about like these eyewitness accounts and stuff in your message from this past weekend. So you brought up James, which is the half-brother of Jesus, and yep. you talked about like a, he was... He was martyred, and I actually didn't know how he died. Yeah. And can you, like, just kind of quickly say, like, how, how that happened? Or So I do know that James was, the, you know, one of the church fathers in Jerusalem. And uh, he died before 70 AD, so we know that for sure, because that's when Jerusalem fell to, uh, to General Titus from the Romans. But uh, long before that, in the, early, in the early persecution of the church in Judea, um, well, in Jerusalem, what happened was um, he was a church father, and 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 I'm I don't I don't like have the breakdown in front of me, but if if I remember correctly, he was beheaded um, by the Jewish leaders um, for being a Christ follower, and because of his connection to Christ and the validity of his witness to Christ um, and his leadership of the church in Jerusalem. Because remember, you know, they didn't have churches back then, so the, they would meet in the temple, in the courtyards of the temple is where they would have met and worshipped. Yeah, worship. that's right, yeah. And uh, then they met in houses and different things like that. But uh, James was put to death uh, not too long after Jesus, uh, after Jesus ascended. It was within a few years. Do you want me to look real quick? Yeah, sure. You want to play some background music yeah. for this part? That'd be awesome. Let me, let me double check. I, one good book, if you ever want to read about the mar- martyrs, uh, DC Talk did a good book called Jesus Freaks 1 and 2, and it's about Jesus modern. Jesus Freaks. Yeah, modern and um, early martyrs within the church. Um, and then... Uh, so Jesus Freaks 1 and 2, and it's based out of Fox's Book of Martyrs. A really, really good uh, resource. So, so James, the, the half-brother of Jesus, um, he died uh, a martyr of, as we said, of the church in Jerusalem. He was one of the, during the apostolic age. With the a- apostolic age would have been the age when the apostles. Now the gift of apostleship nowadays is different than the apostles, excuse me. Um, 
the apostles, the age of the apostles was the age when those who had walked with and had firsthand accounts with Jesus, right? They, they had interacted with him. Mm. That was the apostolic age during the age of the apostles. And uh, James being one of the apostles was a church father in the apostolic age in Jerusalem. In 62, they believe he was martyred in 62 AD. And um, that would have been done just before the war of... Um, General Titus on Jerusalem when they surrounded and destroyed Jerusalem. But the, the date on him is 62. He was beheaded. Uh, there is also some evidence for possibly him being martyred as late as 69 AD, which um, I, I, I don't know. It, all evidence seems to point to 62 AD, but um, he was an apostolic father of the church, leading the church. You can read the book of James. He, um, he's a devout Jew who came to know Christ. And, and further than that, like he wanted their faith living and active and functioning. Just, oh man, powerful man of God. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's a little bit about James. Huh. And one of the, uh, the quotes I highlighted from your message, and I, I think you were talking about James specifically, you said you don't just make something up and then give your life in service to it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh. Yeah. Well, you know why, did that resonate? Do you know why that resonated with you? I know why. Why? Because we went to a North Point Church down in uh, Atlanta yep. just over a year ago, mm -hmm. and Andy Stanley talked on this. He did a much, oh. yeah, he did a much okay, better job. I've got my notes from it somewhere. Yeah, Andy Stanley's awesome. Uh, I, I like Andy. I think he's a phenomenal Bible teacher. Yeah. Um, but he talked about this, and it really resonated with me, and I think that's one of the reasons you called it up, and it's one of the reasons it was so readily available in my mind in working mm -hmm. on this teaching was because um, knowing that the brother of Jesus, like if you just think about your sibling relationships, you, you would mourn them, you would grieve them, but you wouldn't say they were God, especially if you were a faithful Jew. You wouldn't, you wouldn't do that. That, that's the interesting thing about this, that, that James gave his life to working and serving his brother Jesus, whom he saw crucified and died and resurrected. But if he didn't resurrect, then James spent the rest of his life. So let's say that Jesus was 33 when he died. That's the guess, the pretty accurate guess. He was right around 33 years old when he died. If James is his little brother, let's say he's five years younger. He's 27 when Jesus dies. For the rest of his life, for the next 40 years, he spent his life doing one of two things, promoting a thing he knew to be a lie at great personal risk and cost to himself. He lost his community in the Jewish community. He was in exile in his own land now, and he was hated by the authorities. He was seen as someone who was part of a sect um, of Judaism, that the Romans hated the sects of Judaism because they were generally zealots and, and Rome really kind of was clamping down on that. He lost a lot to live a lie. But not only that, his, his life would have been, for the next 40 years, in service to something that he would have given him his whole self to at great personal cost and then be put to death for it for something that was claiming his brother was God. Like, the, the idea that anyone would do that is madness. And we can look at just the account of James and realize he knew something true that maybe we, by faith, claim, but by experience don't know. We don't know what it's like to have Jesus for our brother the way James did. Mm. And James followed him to the end of his life, not just the end of Jesus' life. A lot of people followed zealots and leaders to the end of the zealot's life. But many of them fall away, all of them fall away very rapidly when the zealot is put to death. But when Jesus was put to death, this rabbinical leader is put to death, somehow his followers expanded exponentially after the coming of the Holy Spirit. Something happened. His evidence and the work of the, the evidence of Christ's resurrection and ascension paired with the uh, coming of the Holy Spirit, the filling of the Holy Spirit, and the transforming work of the Spirit of God in the church caused James to freely and joyfully give his life in service to his brother who had been murdered by the Romans and the Jewish leaders 
40 years earlier. Why would he give up his life so freely? I would say it's because he knew something true about Jesus that maybe we in our context just can't quite imagine. I've been saying 40 years. I was doing math publicly, which always is a mistake. I think it's 30. 30, yeah, around 30 years he would have lived after the life of Christ. Yeah. Yeah, so that's what I would, that's how I would kind of put it in. Like, that's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. Like when you think about the people who followed Jesus and that they were, they could have, well, they tried to go back to their fishing. Like it says in the Gospels that they went back and started fishing again. Jesus found John and, um, you know, Andrew and Peter and all of them out fishing. It's what they knew to do. Their leader was killed, so they were doing what other people in their situation had done. When the zealot, the rabbi, the great leader was killed by the state, they went back to their former lives and were like, well, I guess he wasn't the Messiah. But this resurrected Messiah came and got them and brought them back, reinstated Peter, and gave them the great commission, right? The Mm. great commission, when you look at it and you go, oh my goodness, these guys tried to go back to their life and Jesus was like, yeah, no, Mm. remember. And he came back to them resurrected from the dead. And they followed him to the end of their life. You know, the night of Jesus' uh, trial, Peter betrayed him. He betrayed him. He was like, no, I don't know the man. Leave me alone. I don't know the man, right? To the end of his life, all he said is, I met the man. My life is in service to the man. Who is this man? It's Jesus Christ, who you crucified. He says that at his at his uh, sermon on, uh, on Pentecost Sunday. He's talking to you know, the, the people in the temple uh, when the Holy Spirit comes, and he says, this Jesus whom you crucified, and, and you've got to remember, like the, the temple of the Antonian temple would have been, uh, the Antonian fortress would have been on the, on the kind of wall above where he was speaking. So if you look right out there, like where the bridge is for the building, imagine that whole thing, like just massive. It's an Antonian fortress where the garrison of Roman soldiers is, and they're looking down on the temple, ready to quell any riots. And you've got Peter standing there talking about Jesus, and he's like, and this Jesus whom you, you crucified, is both Lord and Messiah. Like, that's crazy. If you saw him dead, you wouldn't follow him. What, what it tells me is he saw him alive. And after you've been flogged, which is a death sentence for most people, and crucified and pierced with a spear, even if you resurrected three days later because you didn't quite die, you're gonna look like a piece of like, of, you're gonna look. You're gonna look wrecked, physically butchered and ruined. It would have destroyed Jesus's physical body. Yet, he appeared to them, and he had the hands on it. Marks on his hands, his side, and his feet. But the but the the mess of his physical body was no longer the the brutality of his death wasn't on him. The glorified, resurrected body of the Lord Jesus was. So it tells me something. The person they encountered bearing the scars of Jesus' death was the glorified body, not of a Jesus who didn't quite die but kind of crawled out of the tomb on his own. No, that's not who did that. Jesus didn't just crawl out of the tomb, beat up, and still breathing. No, Jesus was resurrected, and his new life, like when we talk about Jesus went and took the, ga- the keys to death and hell, and I've had people say to me, like, you know, why do we say in the, in the creed he descended to hell? Anytime hell is separation from God, mm-hmm. and we know on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Those are Jesus' words. So Jesus went and he experienced hell, and he took back the keys, and when he was raised, he was raised to new life. It was the glorified life of the risen Christ, and that's when I, why Paul Paul says, you know, for any who are in Christ, the old is gone and the new has come because there is the promise of a glorified us. We will be glorified and made like him in his image. The transformation is very slow and purposeful right now. But just like Jesus Christ, when he rose, the broken body, the broken body wasn't the, the same on him. His glorified body was full and healed and so will we be. And I just love that. I look at that and I'm like, think of what the disciples, all this I'm, I'm just kind of babbling about right now is saying that um, at some point they looked and realized it was him. Like on the road to Emmaus when the disciples were walking with him, they didn't really recognize him. 
And then he sits down at a meal and it says when he broke the bread, they realized it was him. And they said, didn't our hearts like just dance within us while he talked to us? Why? Because all of a sudden when they realized it's him, they're like, oh, and he was spirited away. I love the fact that they encountered the risen Christ in such a way that his death didn't hold sway over the way they were gonna live now. They saw his death, but now they had seen his resurrected body and that's why we have language, I believe, that says, you know, where, oh, death is your victory. We see that it doesn't have a victory because they saw the risen Christ. Like they saw him, they experienced him, and they know him. He ate with them and talked with them. That is so awesome to me. Like that, that, people are like, why are you so sure of the gospel? Because they were. Because they were, they wrote books, they gave their lives, and they they raised up churches, and they didn't just lead themselves into death. Thousands and millions of people who have confessed Christ have died because of the work they did in sharing Jesus. And those people met Jesus in a real way, and why? Why did they do that? Because the disciples saw his death, they saw his resurrected body, and they believed the claim that that life was extended to them. So that they're not just, James didn't just lose his life if he was living a lie. He has cost the lives of countless millions after. Or he has been somebody who led countless millions to the Lord Jesus Christ, whose lives found purpose, meaning, and salvation in the one thing James took solace in. And it wasn't his community. It wasn't his life that he would have had in Nazareth as the son of Joseph, as a carpenter or anything. It was, it was in Jesus Christ. Sorry. It's so good and it's so exciting when you think about the reality like when Andy talked about that, like my, my, my mind was just like, yes, that is so true. His brothers testified to his risenness, to his resurrected state. His disciples testified that they had seen his risen body and they had seen his crucified body, yet they held to the risen body. And it's why they face death with such confidence now, because they knew what came after death was something akin to the one who rose first. And it says, you know, Jesus died our death, but in his resurrection, he pulled all of us up with him. I think that's a Lewis quote, a C.S. Lewis quote. We'll get to so, that. Yeah, we'll get to that in a while. But it, so that's why I get so excited. I love that. I love it. It's the witness of the church. It's why in Revelation we will overcome the enemy by the blood of Jesus Christ, which was shed in his death, and the word of our testimony. And what is our testimony rooted in? The fact that death didn't win and that Jesus rose from the grave and we claim with him an eternal life. So I, I rambled there for a minute, but let me ask, do you have anything like me saying that? Did it? Did it? Did it spark anything from what you heard when we were at Andy Stanley's church? Anything that resonates with you from that? Um, I remember one thing that Andy said was that, and it's funny, I mean, he's Andy Stanley, and I think he told me too that, like, he, he's Andy, like, he can get away with it because he's Andy. Um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah, because he said some controversial yeah, things that day. Yeah. I remember that. Well, I think you'll remember too when I say it. Um, he said, if, our faith is like rooted in the Bible, Mm -hmm. then we'll be like fighting till the day we die, defending every single thing in the Bible. Yes. But if our faith is rooted in the resurrection, then that is like the one thing. And what do you remember from that? Because that's that's what I remember him saying. Oh, (laughs) Kyle. Dude, I, oh man. So let me say this. I am a reformed Christian, okay? One of the pillars of the Reformation, sola scriptura, only by scripture, right? Uh, sola, sola fideles, it's only by faith, you know? Um, sola Christos, only by Christ. There's these, these pillars of the Reformation. I am a sola scriptura Christian. By the word of God, we receive the full revelation. And by the spirit of God speaking into it, we get it. I get the principle of what Andy was saying. Yep. And I don't want to have this conversation with him in public because I would lose and that'd make <laughs> me mad. But I think I, think I could take him. I, I could wrestle him to the ground unless he has bodyguards and then Andy would get me. But, um, but here's the thing. 
I like, I like what Andy's saying. We could, we could fight about what goes on in the book of Judges, all the war in the Old Testament, all these things, and, and miss the central claim of Scripture is Christ. Everything before it is leading up to Christ. Everything after is pointing back to it and echoing the promise of a second coming. I get what Andy's saying. Because of the resurrection, without the resurrection of Jesus, we're not talking about any of it. We're not talking about any of it. No one cares what happens in Judges without Jesus. Because without Jesus, there's no point to it. But because of Jesus, you've added that value, and and it's so big. It's so incredibly big. So because of Jesus, um, we've got to look at Judges through that lens. I don't think, um, I don't go as far as Andy went in in it as, as, kind of how you worded it. I don't Mm. want to butcher your words. But I would say this, because of the resurrection, we have to take everything seriously Mm. and we have to be willing to face it. I think one thing that could happen is people could dismiss by Andy's words some of the things in the Old Testament and, and not allow the Spirit of God to do what Paul said about the Word of God. All scripture is God-breathed, and it's useful for admonishing, for teaching, for rebuking. We do not want to remove any scripture and just focus only on the resurrection. What we want to do is let the resurrection give value to all scripture. Mm. Ooh, I super like that, and that's it. That's it. So I'm not in disagreement with Andy's premise. He's saying, don't fight about creation six days in a rest. But I'm like, what if I want to fight? What if, what if I want to fight that? What if I want to look at that? I don't think it's wrong to look and say, I, I love what he said about creation. I think I said it uh, yesterday. I'm not so concerned with the timeline of it as I am concerned with the agency of creator. There was a creator. There is a creator, right? And that creator has given order, structure, and spoken the truth of what happened through the prophet Moses in the first five books of the Bible. And we can look at it and we can take confidence in it because you can look at the Genesis account of creation and science will say, I don't know how those nomads knew so much of the created order. It's overly simplistic, Yes, but for them to understand the complexity of how God set everything in motion and that Genesis would speak to the iTunes generation today as much as it does to the Exodus generation multiple thousands of years ago tells me this. There's a truth in Genesis 1, 2, and 3 that cannot be denied or diluted. So yes, Andy, I agree The agency of creator matters most. We need to believe in that because to be created means there was an intentionality. To be biological happenstance over billions of years means there's nothing going on here but um, but the darkest form of like you know Nietzsche it's it's kind of a, a get for you what you can who was Nietzsche uh, he was a, a philosopher uh, post renaissance uh, just yeah late renaissance philosopher he wrote God is dead um, so there's these different um, different atheists who did that. But what I'm, what I'm saying is that is we, when you remove creator, you remove identity and purpose. And I think that's what Andy's saying is don't get hung up on all these little things. Get hung up on the fact that there is a creator and he chose you. He formed you. It's so intentional. Yeah. It's why um, in my life I do a lot of painful hard work in relationships. Relationships matter. Why? Because God created them. Mm. And even if I don't, even if I'm working something out, it still matters. Why? Because God loves them. He loves them dearly. He's got purposes for them. And the one thing you don't want to do is someone to remove purpose in someone's life Mm. or to remove for them a sense of God calledness or whatever. So I look at that and I go, knowing there's an agency of a creator tells me that the creation matters. Why? Because he, God, thought you were worth making. And it's the only time God spoke into the seas. He spoke into the land. He spoke out light. He spoke the separation of land and sea and light and darkness. But he got down and he formed us. He put us together. He he used his hands, not just his words. He used his hands in forming us. That speaks value. When we talk about creation and creator, it tells us why the resurrection took place. Because we matter. We're special. 
Like, oh my gosh, for all you like kids who were raised, your mom said you're special. It's true. <laughs> Jesus was Jesus thought you were worth dying for. And and the very notion of that is madness if you don't believe in God. Why would you matter at all? What if you just took that quote and put it oh, yeah. <laughs> Why would you matter? But why would you matter at all if you weren't created? If if you weren't created, then my only job in life would be dominating you and exploiting you for my own gain. But I don't believe that's, I don't think that's morally, ethically okay. And here's the funny thing, neither do the secularists, neither do the atheists. Like, you can't treat people like that. And I heard it's because that God gave you a conscience. God gave everybody a conscience. Like, it's like the, what was it, like the, is it the law of God is written on your heart? Yeah, yeah, so in Romans, God's saying, like, I've put the word of God in their heart. They, they live by a moral code for people who haven't heard the gospel. Why would people who've never heard the gospel have a sense of morality about them? Not everybody does. Well, actually, that's not true. Everybody has a sense of morality. It may be a broken morality, but mm-hmm. what an interesting thing that we would have any kind of morality if all we were was trying to make sure we have enough food, enough, you know, if we were just surviving. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, this is super good. Yeah, this I've is enjoyed really good. This conversation. Oh, man. <laughs> oh man, I hope I'm not just misspeaking. Yeah, no, I, I, this is the stuff I really like talking about too. And I know you'd like talking about the next part because you, I know you love bringing up like C.S. Lewis yep, in your I messages because I, I had written something down here. Um, oh man, um, so I had seen a video a couple days ago. Um, one of these guys, I haven't watched him a whole lot on YouTube, but like he's this young, he's probably in his late 30s. Um, he's, he's, he's a pastor. He's very young. His, <laughs> basically a child. His name is Mike Winger on okay. YouTube. <laughs> hey, I, Justin, do you remember Winger, the band? Justin! <laughs> I just heard, huh? <laughs> no, he's got a, a he'll, he'll totally remember <laughs> Winger. Oh, man. <laughs> do you remember Winger, the band? Yeah. Kip Winger? Not Weezer. Weezer. I know Weezer. Oh, shoot. Okay, <laughs> never mind. I'm too old. Uh, All right. Sorry. Well, anyway. Sorry. Right, thank Winger. you, Justin. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, so his name's Mike Winger on YouTube. He has a lot of just very long videos, so I I feel like I hardly have the time to get around to them. Yeah. Um, but I think he streams like once or twice a week. And anyway, so he had this nice three-minute clip, and I was like, perfect, something I, I have time watch to watch. I watch that, Winger. And he said it was like um, – answering like Christopher Hitchens, he was like a very, you know, Christopher oh, yeah. Hitchens, right? Yeah. yeah, he was like a really well-known atheist and he, I think he died a few years ago. Um, and he said like, answering Christopher Hitchens' unanswerable question. And so Christopher Hitchens claims in like all of his debates with Christians that he's been in, he asked the question like, what is a moral thing that a Christian can do that an atheist can't do? And so Hitchens is like all, I don't want to be like, Wow, look at Kyle. Like Kyle knows everything or whatever. But like, well, he I think he he took pride in the fact that often he could like never get an answer. Or I think he even said like all the time he'd never get an answer. And if he got an answer, it was something like tithe. Um mm-hmm. which I think was a joke. Um <laughs> but uh Well let now wait. I'm gonna push on that. Okay. So so let, let's just look at it real quick. What is a tithe? Tithe is is giving your money back to God. Okay, I don't even want to call it your money. No, but, it's okay. Okay. Well, it's, it's giving back to God okay. for his mission and his purposes, correct? Yes. Okay. Well, it, I mean, yes and no. You know, it's like, it's like driving by this building and being like, what is that? Oh, it's a steel box. It's a steel box that holds people on a few days a week, and I think there's some offices there. It's true. It's so incomplete. You know, it's so incomplete of what this place represents for our community, for where, how we gather together in different things, right? It's just an incomplete description. The tithe is a spiritual principle. And it's saying this, that yes, I am gifted. Yes, I am talented. And yes, I was able to earn this money. Yes, all those things are true. I worked hard. I was probably self-motivated. And I'm gonna take a 10th of it and I'm going to give it to God in recognition. It's, it's, a, it's a spiritual posture of life that says all the work I put in, everything that is there, this, this tithe is a recognition 
that I'm only able to do it because there was one who put into me the gifts, the talents, the drive, the hunger, the want, the, the, um, the discipline, the self-control, the understanding, the physical, um, the physical relationship between eye-hand coordination, you know, and different things to do what I do. I am giving this back to God, not because I have to, not because God needs your money. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, which in our day and age would say, you know, he owns Tesla, Ford, GMC, Maserati, he owns them all, and he doesn't need any more. He, God doesn't need your money. What does he want? What often holds the place in our hearts that it shouldn't? Money mm-hmm. and, and, and our sense of individuality. And our sense of individuality should come from the fact that we were uniquely created by God, not that we have a bunch of stuff that's ours. That's a toxic individuality. I'm not against capitalism and having things that are yours, but I am against um, I am against a mentality that would say to us, you can possess for yourself things that you lose immediately upon death. What are we doing in tithing? We're recognizing that um, this life we live until we die was equipped, gifted, and, and literally put into our possession to live in a way that honors God. So in honoring God, I give back the first fruits of my hard work. It is my hard work when I give back to God. And I don't give it back because I have to. I give it back out of relationship with my understanding of my relationship with God. God is creator and and a, the God who gives you know, everything to me from the breath of my lungs to the skills and talents, I'm giving it back to him, not out of his need, but out of mine. My need to recognize his lordship in all that I do and all that I've accomplished. So, um, you know, as a founding pastor of this church, I'll be honest, like sometimes it's hard not to be prideful. You're like, yeah, you walked in, you're like, I can't believe, and I don't even want to say the words, I did this. And there's times where it comes through my mind. And what comes out of my mind immediately after that is the words of King Nebuchadnezzar when he's walking on the roof of his palace and he says, isn't this Babylon, which I have established for my glory through my power and why the words were on his lips, God said to him, you're gonna be like the cattle for the next seven years, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And, And that's what I think. I'm like, this is not, I need to recognize God's sovereign hand in everything because I want to possess it for myself at a very base level. The tithe is in literally it's an adjustment of your posture spiritually that keeps me from wanting to say, I can't believe, it. here's my, my kind of line in it, Kyle. I can't believe what we've done. I can't believe what we've gotten to do. And that goes to the staff, that goes to the church, that goes to, um, to the people who've um, wanted to support us from beyond the walls of the church. That goes to the people who are worshiping with us in Colorado and um, in different places throughout the, the world. We have family in Berlin that watches every week. Like, I love that. I love that. Look what, what, what we got to do in what? partnership with God, by his divine providence, we did this. The tithe puts me in a posture to get myself off the throne of my own life and put God where he belongs. So the tithe is something Hitchens could never do because he will never recognize the authority of the creator in his life. His is a life of manifest destiny. His is the Icarus. He is going to, by his own bootstraps, pull it up. And where is he now? He is pushing up daisies, right? How'd that work out? I'm not trying to be cavalier with him. I'm saying he could never tithe. He could never tithe because tithing is a principle and a spiritual posture. And when your spirit is utterly opposed to God, how can you participate in something that brings you into submission? So I would say that was a phenomenal answer. It just needed that kind of working out. Mm. So I think... (laughs) <laughs> All of that was fantastic, and was I didn't even expect it. Like, cause, I know, because in his video, like, it was kind of kind of funny. Because, like, yeah, why why in the world would an atheist tithe? Um, right. But what he said as like he just kind of paused the video and he had sat and he thought about it and he was like, "Love God." Yep. And he said it That's even doesn't better. even cross his mind, and it's the first commandment. Like I like I am the Lord your God, like you or what, whatever yeah. Jesus said. Like yeah. you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Right. And I was just like, oh, man, that is 
it just seems so simple too. And yeah. there was somebody commented on the video that I wrote down because it was from C.S. Lewis, and it said, "Those who love man less than God do most for man." Does that, that make funny? sense to you? Oh yeah, it yeah. makes perfect sense. Yeah. It makes perfect sense because here's the thing. If I love God and I believe, like, Kyle, if I believe you are called, equipped, and able to do something, I am going to pursue you and I'm going to speak into that only because of the value God has shared for your life to me. Right? Mm. I mean, I would say a number of times, I not only thanked you for your work, but you're a hard worker and you, you grind here. I mean, you do a lot of work, video stuff, just a ton of work. And I appreciate it. I think you hear that from your direct report. I think you hear it from me. But here's the thing. Below all that is, is a God-given sense of worth. And uh, when you were in college... And way, well, way back in Vreesland when you were a kid and mm. these different things kind of coming up and you got on, you, know, you got your AFV t-shirt and you did this stuff. You always had a knack for this stuff. But when you, when you came here as kind of an intern when you were still in college, um, one of the things I said to you and I talked to you about is there's a bright future for you here. You were 19 or 20 at the time. And I said, we really have a place for you. And I want you to, to invest your energies here. I think you're gifted. I think you're talented. I looked at your work and was like, that's great. But more than that, there was a fittedness to the need the church had, the gifting you have, the effort you had made to educate that gifting through the Grand Valley video program, and, um, and all the work you had done and the pairing of God. You have such an evangelistic heart. You have a desire for people to know God. And that pairs so perfectly with who we are. So for me, in saying that to you, what I was, what I was speaking back into was an intrinsic value to you. It was unproven at that time, right? You had done a couple decent things, but there was something more valuable about you and God's plan that like, and I feel like God did show me. I was like, oh my gosh. What this guy has as a, as a person, we need. And I couldn't quantify it at the time. And we do things. I mean, I had people do that for me. A friend of mine um, invested so generously into my seminary education. I could have never done it. He invested that. Why? Because God showed him something in me that I didn't even know was there. And we remain friends to this day. And here's the thing. I love that. He did generously more for me than he ever should have. Why? Because God spoke value to him about me. And so he invested into what God saw. Like, that's awesome. Yeah. In the world, here's what I would do. I would hire you because you're good at film. And when you tick me off or piss me, I would tick, when you tick me off, I would get rid of you. But I'm not, I, I mean, you, you've made me mad. I've made you mad. Why we get mad? We all get mad all the time. We not all the time, but we have times where we're like, you know, I didn't like that, or something didn't go well, or or you get painful feedback. You're like, oh, and you feel frustrated, but you don't throw that away. You're not like, oh no, never mind. I just don't like Kyle. No, no, it's not a matter of like of of just like oh, whatever. You're not doing your job or doing your thing. It's so much more. It's so much more about what God called you to do and be here for people out there. And I believe in their value, but if it was just about work, um, you know, to me, I'm like, you would see a great deal of like, I don't know if it's, it's not dissatisfaction, but, but I'll go back to it, it's calling. There's a sense of calling in you to reach people beyond the borders of this church with the truth of the gospel. Why? God is putting a value for them in you. You've wanted to do like this podcast and do things well. Not, not a, I think you want to do it because you like when we say good job, but more than that, you like when people out there get connected to the truth of the gospel. Why? Why would you care? unless God put in you a love for them. You are doing this for people who you do not, will probably, many of them never ever meet. Like how fun is that? 
you begin to realize, like, yeah, we Christians do more for the people we'll never know than we do for the, you know, because we love God. We do more for them because we love God. And what does God say? Love me. And by the way, love your neighbor as yourself. That's what we end up doing. Mm. It's a really long way to say it, but I just, I think, um, I think it's really important that we remember, you know, before Christianity, um, the family, the nuclear family, the, you know, in the Roman Empire, that didn't exist. It was to procreate people. There was things going on culturally, the, the, the secular values of this world for human life and different things, they didn't exist before what? before the advent of Christ. The coming of Christ poured value back into humanity. Every individual mattered to God. Why? Because Jesus died for every one of them. So I think that's, that's the aspect of it. We do, love, we do love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And a beautiful byproduct of doing that is the natural capacity, doesn't mean we live into it, but it's a capacity to love our neighbor as ourself, mm. which is super life-giving. It's very life-giving. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, thank you for tuning in to uh, Puffy Vest Monday. I know this was quite an occasion for us. So. Mm, mm. Uh, sorry. I was just. <laughs> that was. Just, yeah, I just like. <laughs> you're like, don't touch me. Oh, in your shadow puppets. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I won't do it again. Well, anyway, um, I think that we had a lot of really good things that we covered in today. Yeah, and yeah. While we didn't have quite all the time that we wanted to, I think that we can save some of this for the next episode that we do. Absolutely. So, Thank you for taking the time to listen to this or whether you're watching this. Um, we really appreciate it. We know that we have a lot of fun doing this. So yeah. and thank you for taking the time to yeah. do another one of these episodes. Oh, I love it. Too, it's so, so much fun. Yeah. It's so much fun. Yeah. Thanks for listening to my ravings. Yeah. I kind of got a little loud this week. Yeah. No, it was great. All right. But anyway, yeah, um, we'll catch you next time. And until then, have a great week.